Lord of Mysteries. Chapter 480 Honest Rewards In the hall where the stone pillars had collapsed, a group of nighthawks wearing black windbreakers and silk hats appeared around the altar. The person leading the team was the Archbishop of the Church of the Evernight Goddess, St. Anthony Stevenson. It was disrupted by someone. He muttered without stopping and directly walked to the stone door that led to the interior. Rich darkness surfaced as the stone door silently opened. Saint Anthony led some of the Nighthawks in as they delved deeper. Along the way, they didn't discover a single guard or anything of value. It was as if this place had been forcefully swept clean. Finally, they reached a room in the deepest recesses, but there was nothing there but walls and stone pillars. The blue door of light which was there when Klein left was long gone. The lanterns in the Nighthawk's hands suddenly lost their light, and darkness enveloped the room. When everything returned to normal, they found that the surrounding walls had somehow melted away. However, there were no hidden doors or tunnels behind them. It was either a thick layer of mud and rocks or the corridor they came from. St. Anthony was silent for more than ten seconds before saying, Try divination. Search the vicinity. Achu, walking through the pathless cliffs and forest, Klein was saddened to realize that he had apparently really fallen sick. The residual effects of Mr. A's Beyonder powers, combined with the fact that he was drenched during winter, gave him the shameful cold. However, he didn't dare to stop to collect dry twigs to light a fire and dry his clothes and money. He was afraid that the Beyonders of the church would find him. Even though he had already gained the endorsement of Stanton Isengard from the machinery hive mind and obtained the status of a semi-official, this was a matter involving the primordial demoness's awakening and the true creator's descent, two cases of the highest order. Therefore, he was bound to be subjected to rigorous investigations, have tea sessions with the machinery hive mind, mandated punishers, and nighthawks to recount the whole process actively or passively. There were two major pitfalls to this. One was that he knew people inside the Nighthawks, and although Detective Sherlock Moriarty looked quite different from the martyred Klein Moriarty, making it impossible to identify him via photographs, he had zero confidence if things were done face to face. Two, because of similar pathways, the Church of the Evernight Goddess wasn't very friendly to people and things related to death. Back in the Pale Era at the end of the Fourth Epoch, Death had fallen under the siege of the Seven Gods, and Sherlock Moriarty had summoned a powerful descendant of Death at the critical moment. This wasn't a problem that could be explained away easily. That high-level powerhouse was rushing to deal with NC Zangwill and Zero Minus Eight, so she didn't have time to bother with a friendly small fry like me. However, I can't be careless as a result. I should flee when it's necessary. Yes, I can write to the machinery hive mind when I have a chance, stating the second reason as to why I have to temporarily leave Backland. This way, I might still have a chance to work with them in the future. Of course, I have to secretly observe to see if the machinery hive mind has any strong enmity towards any descendants of death. I wonder how Mr. Azik is doing. Heh <laughs> heh. Perhaps Sherlock Moriarty might be dead in the official announcement. He sure lived up to his name and identity. As quickly as possible, Klein tried to find a small town and blend in with the crowd while enduring the alternating fever and cold. Only in human society could the faceless's powers be fully expressed. The woman who was working with Mr. A, uh, she should be a demoness. She went to Eastborough. From the looks of the ritual, there must have been a large number of deaths over there. I wonder, with the spiritual intuition of a seer, Klein's heart suddenly felt heavy. At this moment, all the colors in front of his eyes turned saturated, as if they had been sprinkled with oil by a deity. The feeling was over instantly, and Klein found himself far away from where he had been, with the bronze-skinned, soft-featured Azik Eggers appearing next to him. Mr. Azik, are you unhurt? He couldn't help but heave a sigh of relief. I am, Azik replied frankly before smiling. But to an undying, this isn't a big problem. Klein calmed down and asked, What happened to Nc Zangwill and Zeraminus 8? Nc Zangwill is still alive, and he still wields the Grade Zero sealed artifact, Azik said as he walked. Klein tried hard to follow him as he couldn't help but sigh. What a pity. Don't worry about it. He was severely injured, Azik solemnly said. And most importantly, we know that he was secretly cooperating with the royal family, so we don't have to worry about not being able to find him in the future. This way, you can focus on improving yourself, and I can also try to go to a few places that I've recalled to awaken more memories. Hey <laughs> hey, your luck isn't bad. I've been secretly observing the people from MI9 and the royal family to confirm and see Zangwill's whereabouts. One of the most important places was Red Rose Manor, so I've always been wandering around the area. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to rush over to save you so quickly. Klein immediately felt a little awkward when this was mentioned. Mr. Azik, aren't you puzzled as to why I didn't die? 
I often wake up after entering a coffin as well. This is something that I previously recalled, Azik said with a smile, completely unfazed by the matter. And in my incomplete memory, although it's rare in others, it's not without precedent. He often wakes up after entering a coffin. Often, Klein suddenly realized that the problems that he was worried about were nothing in the eyes of a real powerhouse, as expected of an undying of the death pathway. Well, Mr. Azik had mentioned that he had been in this sequence for a long time, which means that he has long advanced. Klein thought for a moment, then he asked with concern, Mr. Azik, would N.C. Zangwill discover that I'm Klein Morty? He was afraid that N.C. Zangwill would take revenge on Benson and Melissa. Unlikely, at most, he would believe that we knew each other long ago, or that you're my informant, if we use the terms that the police uses, Azik recalled and said, but that grade zero sealed artifact might notice it, but you don't have to worry. Why? Klein pressed. It was unknown what Azik had remembered, but his expression suddenly turned strange. It was as if he wanted to laugh, but at the same time, he felt horrified. That grade zero sealed artifact will keep attempting to write down the death of its owner. This is likely to be intrinsic to it and cannot be changed. Therefore, I doubt it would actively divulge such important information that can put in C. Zangwill at a tremendous advantage during such a critical moment, unless it involves something that it cannot avoid or explain. Seeing that Mr. Azik was so sure about it while producing such strong justifications, Klein exhaled. It was as if he had recovered a little from the cold. Seeing this, Azik added, It's best if you leave Backlund for the time being. And C. Zangwill might use the Grade Zero Sealed Artifact to seek revenge again, using your fake name. As long as you aren't in Backland, it should be fine. That Grade Zero Sealed Artifact's sphere of influence doesn't exceed a large city. Just as I had predicted, there's a limit to its sphere of influence. Otherwise, N.C. Zangwill could have easily hidden in a small town in the southern continent and leisurely arranged the fates of all his targets without having to worry about anyone finding him. Klein asked after some deliberation, A short trip to Backland for a day or half a day is fine, right? with the premise that I've changed my identity and looks. With that, he rubbed his face, instantly reverting back to his appearance back in Tinjin. Azik's eyebrows twitched, and he nodded. It's fine. He turned his head and looked into the distance at the spot that he could no longer see. It seems like I've been targeted by a powerful existence of the Church of the Evernight Goddess. It's best if you don't stay by my side, or you might be implicated. Haha. <laughs> They're very interested in the Beyonder characteristics related to death. Yes, I plan on heading out to sea. While I digest my potion, I'll be seeking mermaids. It's a condition for my advancement, Klein explained his plan. Azik tilted his head. Mermaids. Could a mermaid in the form of a dead spirit work? I can find at least four. Probably. Not. Klein reached out and wiped his forehead. His intuition told him that it was definitely impossible, but he planned to divine it above the gray fog to confirm it. Without mentioning the dead mermaid again, Azik said, if there's anything, then contact me through the messenger. Messenger. Klein suddenly felt guilt-ridden and ashamed. I had died in my battle with Mr. It saved my life. Azik gave him a glance, shook his head, and laughed. Don't worry about it. As long as it isn't killed by a powerhouse at the level of an angel or via some special method. Then as long as the underworld still exists, it can slowly be reborn there. And before that, I have similar messengers numbering. Uh, I don't know how many there are either. It sounds like there's an army of such powerful and humongous messengers. Klein turned agape, unable to say a word. His shame faded, and he asked curiously, Mr. Azik, where is the underworld? Or in other words, hell. The spirit world. To be precise, it's a special place that the ancient death created in the spirit world. Azik didn't hide the truth. Ancient death. That should be the ancient god, Phoenix ancestor Gregrace. So the underworld belongs to the spirit world. No wonder the basic structure in mysticism is the real world, the spirit world, and the astral world. It doesn't contain the underworld and the abyss. Klein was about to ask a question when he suddenly remembered something and quickly said, Mr. Azik, I obtained a card of blasphemy created by Emperor Roselle. It contains the secrets of high-sequence Beyonders. I believe it can help you recall more things. However, you'll have to wait a while. It's hidden in Backland. Klein didn't mention the bounty, fearing that it would reveal the Tarot Club's secret, the mysterious space above the Grey Fog, and Miss Justice, therefore, he could show his gratitude towards Mr. Azik for his help and sacrifice, in this tactful way. Aziz looked at him in surprise, but he ultimately said nothing. He nodded and said, When you get it back, have the messenger bring it to me. I'll immediately return it to you after I study it. Or you can copy the contents and pass it to me. He paused for a moment as if he had thought of something. Then, he took out a glove that was so thin that it looked like it was made of human skin from his pocket and handed it to Klein. 
I've already awakened the relevant memories, so I no longer need it. Heh heh. It's an item that that pirate rear admiral left behind. I've placed some seals on it so that it wouldn't be hungry. However, every time it's used it will require you to use a human's flesh and soul to feed it. Otherwise, it will devour you. Creeping hunger. The remains of a particular shepherd. Klein immediately recalled what the glove represented. Chapter 481, Statistics and People In a small town on the outskirts of Backland, after changing into clean and dry clothes, Klein placed the wet bills on the surface of the table, one by one, waiting for them to dry naturally in the warm room. During this process, he moved very carefully and very gently. Even his sneezing and coughing which were brought by the fever had been forcefully suppressed. To make sure there were no mistakes, he didn't dry them by controlling a flame. Having done all this, he walked to the corner of the hotel room, where there was a full-length mirror. Klein's black hair was neatly combed in the mirror. He had a pair of dark brown eyes, and his face was thin and angular. He had gold-rimmed glasses on the bridge of his nose and was beardless. He looked young but also experienced. This was a modification of Zhu Mingrui's appearance, with the traits of a native from the northern continent. Moreover, this was his youthful appearance during university when he was filled with vigor, one that had yet to be made fat by society. He intended to go back to Backland when things have settled down a little, and then he would get himself a legal identity for his current appearance. Compared to when he left Tingen, he had no shortage of appropriate channels. For example, he had Ian at the Bravehearts Bar, Miss Sharon's Circle, and Detective Isengard Stanton. How nostalgic, Klein whispered. He busied himself with a ritual in the room where the curtains had been drawn. He planned to bring creeping hunger above the gray fog to study it safely. Inside the silent, ancient palace, he appeared at the very end of the long bronze table, leaning back in his chair while holding a pair of thin gloves made of human skin. Immediately after, he closed his eyes and extended his spirituality into the object that required sealing. He immediately felt the hunger of the glove. It was as if it had a stomach that could never be filled. But above the gray fog, it was so tame that it didn't dare let out even the slightest bit of malice. It was like a hunting dog lying there, not daring to move at all. Then, Klein heard cries of indignation and groans of pain. Many distorted, hideous, and grieving faces appeared in his spiritual perception, brimming with unspeakable melancholy and madness. These faces were deeply fused with the beyonder characteristics of different colors and different states. Wherever Klein's spirituality spread, it would combine with the corresponding faces and use the powers it had. This is the way to use it. Together with the help of divination, Klein made one attempt after another and figured out what the five souls that the creeping hunger could let out to graze. The first was faceless, but it only had the powers to change his appearance and build. The second was psychiatrist. He could make a target fall into a frenzied state, place a certain amount of psychological cues, and could simulate a dragon's might, intimidating individuals and groups, and creating chaos. The third was interrogator. It allowed the wearer of the glove to be proficient in the use of all kinds of weapons, become a demolition expert, possess the ability to focus his mind, and have the ability to pierce a target's spirit body. The fourth was nightmare. There was only one power, which was to drag someone into a dream without being detected. However, it was unlike a beyonder of the corresponding sequence. It was accomplished by creeping hunger, so the wearer could still move their bodies after entering a nightmare state. The fifth was Priest of Light. It allowed him to produce a halo-like effect, purifying all undead and foul creatures within a certain range. At the same time, he also had the singing ability of a bard which could strengthen his companions, as well as summon the light of holiness which was weaker than flaring sun. The limit is five souls, and the powers are fixed when letting them out to graze for the first time. This isn't something I can decide for myself. It's purely based on luck, maybe there can be three or just one. Klein thoughtfully nodded, sighed, and said to the suffering souls, No matter what kind of people you were in the past, I will gradually free you from your imprisonment to acquire complete deliverance. In the future, the souls I graze will only come from people who have committed heinous and unforgivable crimes. For every such beyonder I kill, I'll replace one of you and release you, regardless of whether I need their powers or not. His solemn but gentle voice echoed within the ancient palace. The wailing souls quieted down, no longer writhing in a hideous fashion. Phew, Klein exhaled, opened his eyes, tapped the edge of the ancient table with his fingers, and said to himself, that faceless's powers overlap with mine, so it's completely useless. Once I have something to replace it with, I'll release him first. Yes, when the time comes, I can attempt to channel his spirit in converse with him. Perhaps I might receive information regarding the high sequences of the seer pathway, as well as clues to the whereabouts of mermaids. No, there's no need to wait for a replacement. 
In a few days, I can make the attempt when I fully recover from my cold. The soul corresponding to the Priest of Light should be able to complete the incomplete formulas I previously obtained. Furthermore, he'll leave behind the corresponding Bayonder characteristic. That way, Little Sun doesn't need to worry about his subsequent advancements. Yes, he will be the second to be released. As for me needing to feed a human soul and flesh to creeping hunger every time it's used, that's not something I need to pay attention to. I usually wouldn't use it anyway. When using it, I'll definitely be facing a terrifying enemy. In such a battle, there's no lack of lives to cull. Even if there isn't, I can throw creeping hunger above the gray fog and not be worried about its backlash, nor do I need to be afraid of harming the innocent. The worst outcome would it becoming unusable. Putting his thoughts away, Klein tried to use the mystical item, creeping hunger, to divine the formula for the shepherd potion but ended up failing. He didn't divine the origins of creeping hunger, afraid that he would provoke an unfriendly existence. Although he wasn't afraid of endangering himself due to the gray fog's isolation and obstruction, doing so could likely damage creeping hunger. I'll consider trying that out when I no longer need it. Klein leaned forward and rested his elbows on the table. He quickly recalled the previous matters and keenly noticed a detail. After the master key was obliterated, its Bayonder characteristic didn't disappear. Instead, it became dots of light, trying hard to converge. It can be assumed that the apprentice characteristic that's formed in the end will no longer contain Mr. Door's roars. In other words, such a method can be used to rid the mental corruption inside a Bayonder characteristic. But the underlying problem is that there's no way to destroy a Bayonder characteristic which has solidified into an item under normal circumstances. Back then, I was relying on a ritual that could allow a true god to descend. It needed the prerequisite of a large number of innocent lives. Also, once the all-black eye is shattered, the true creator's mental corruption that's hidden within will definitely erupt. When that happens, who can withstand it? Do it above the gray fog. As these thoughts crossed his mind, Klein remembered what could have happened at East Burrow. He hurriedly conjured a pen and paper to make the appropriate divination. After receiving the revelation, his expression sank, and slowly, he leaned back in his chair. Below him, the endless gray fog floated in silence in a seemingly eternal unchanging fashion. Audrey stood by the window, looking at the fog mixed with pale yellow and iron black colors rapidly disperse. When she saw the heavy rain that was incompatible with winter, her heart felt more at ease. After an unknown period of time, she and Susie waited for Earl Hall's eventual return home. Father, how is it? Audrey asked with concern. Earl Hall smiled warmly as he handed his coat and hat to an attendant. It's resolved, but the exact details are still unclear. My little princess, you've really helped me greatly this time. You deserve a ton of medals. That's good, that's good. Thanks to Mr. Fool's reminder, thanks to the risky investigation of his adore. Our tarot club has once again stopped the descent of an evil god and saved the world. Audrey's heart was filled with pride. Earl Hall took the towel from the maidservant's hands, wiped his face, and sighed. However, this time, there were still some serious casualties. To think that Backland's smog could become so deadly. Although the statistics haven't been tabulated, I estimate that more than 10,000 people died in East Borough, the dock area, and the factory district. Furthermore, the plague is still spreading, so please try not to leave the house for the time being. More than 10,000 people. That was a statistic Audrey could understand but couldn't imagine. Only on the anniversary of the kingdom's founding and during the parade would she be able to see tens of thousands of people gathered together. However, this didn't stop her heart from feeling heavy as her mood suddenly turned gloomy. Daisy stood outside her apartment, watching the doctors and nurses in white coats and masks enter and carry out the bodies. She had long known the outcome. Her expression was numb and her eyes vacant. She subconsciously moved closer to the door. At this moment, the police officer in charge of the cordon stopped her. Don't go over. Do you want to be infected with the plague? Daisy stood there as she watched the two bodies being carried out. She saw her mother, Liv, hugging her sister, Freja, tightly. They were carried to a cargo carriage that was wrapped in black cloth and temporarily requisitioned. She then watched as they disappeared in front of her eyes as a white cloth covered them. The carriage slowly moved towards the other end of the street. At that moment, Daisy seemed to wake up from a dream. She turned around and ran at full speed, chasing after the carriage. The ground was abnormally muddy after the rain. She fell and got up several times, leaving her body covered in dirt. However, she was still unable to catch up with the carriage and could only watch it disappear around the corner. Daisy slowed her pace, her body swaying slightly as her expression turned abnormally vacant. She held onto the trees by the street and stared at the place where the carriage had left. Suddenly, her entire body went limp, and she started weeping. 
Mother, Freja, the voice was soft, low, sharp, weak, and lingered. At this moment, in Eastboro, the dock area, and the factory district, tens of thousands of people were similarly crying out in grief. Empress Boro, Sola Palace, wearing a crown above his resolute face and thin mustache, George III sat on the throne. He stared at the Earl Palatine in front of him without saying a word. Your Majesty, the people from the three churches are waiting outside for your explanation. The Earl Palatine asked as sweat dripped down his forehead. Explanation. Prince Edisac was seduced by a demoness, causing him to collude with a cult and attempt to rebel. That is the explanation. His schemes were exposed, and he has already committed suicide. What other explanations do they need? George III suddenly flew into a rage. He took a deep breath and regained his usual solemnity. You tell them that anyone who obtains the corresponding aristocratic title via any means can get a seat in the House of Lords. The property restrictions needed for elections will be relaxed, and the invalid constituencies will be removed. This is to appease the factory owners and bankers. Similarly, the National Atmospheric Pollution Council will immediately make their final statement. The relevant bill will soon be passed, and the minimum safeguards and working hours will appear in the form of a law. The poor law shall be reformed in accordance with their requests. The three churches are permitted to send their personnel into the military. Your Majesty, the Earl Palatine was startled. Such a concession was beyond his imagination, especially the last one. George III flared up again. Tell them this, since they want a new order, I will give them a new order. Yes, your majesty. The Earl Palatine didn't dare say anything further and left the palace. George III sat there, unmoving for a long time as though he was a stone statue. After an unknown period of time, his expression suddenly turned gentle. Chapter 482, Ring Out the Old, Ring in the New. Morning of the, the 31st of December, at the Harvest Church south of the bridge, Lynn White stood in a kitchen wearing his priest robes, occasionally tossing different herbs into a large iron pot and stirring them to a certain extent. After all the pre-prepared ingredients were tossed in, he waited patiently for another ten minutes. Then, he scooped up the ink-black liquid with a metal ladle and poured it into a glass cup and glass bottle beside him. 48, 49, 50. Emlyn glanced at the empty pot and counted the medicine he had brewed. After confirming the quantity, he picked up a large tray and brought the bottles of dark green liquid to the hall. In the hall, more than half of the pews had been removed, and the floor was covered with tattered blankets. Lying within them were victims of the plague who were either in deep sleep or groaning in pain. Emlyn and Father Atrowski worked together, each carrying some of the medicine, distributing it from two ends. The first person in the queue was a middle-aged man with a sallow complexion. He hurriedly propped himself up halfway, received the medicine, and drank it. He handed back the bottle and said to him Lynn in gratitude, Father White, thank you very much. I feel much better and have some strength again. Lynn lifted his chin and replied disdainfully, This is only an extremely trivial matter that isn't worth being grateful for. All of you are truly ignorant. With that, he sped up the distribution of the potions. After ten minutes or so, he returned to the altar of Earth Mother and complained to Father Atravsky, You should get two more volunteers. Father Atravsky didn't respond. He looked at the patients and said with a gentle smile, they should be completely healed in two or three days. How do you know? Emlyn turned his head in surprise. Father Atravsky looked down at him benevolently and said, herbal medicine is one of the domains of the Earth Mother. As her believer, I do know some of the basics even if I'm not part of the Earth Pathway. Emlyn tusked, I'm not interested in religion and know little about it, although I've been copying Earth Mother's Bible in the recent months. He inwardly added in a slightly resentful tone before saying, Father, I didn't expect you to accept non-believers in the faith. Among them, only two or three of them are believers of the Earth Mother. Father Atravsky smiled without minding what he said. They are also lives, innocent lives. Mlin paused for a few seconds, exhaled, and said, Father, I've already found a way to resolve the psychological cue. Perhaps I will leave this place soon. Wait, why did I mention this? I was actually moved by him. What if he locks me up in the basement again? Emlyn suddenly turned nervous. Father Atravsky's expression remained unchanged as he looked down and said to Emlyn, Actually, you didn't need to seek out solutions. In a little while, the psychological cue will be automatically removed, and you will be free to choose whether to come to the cathedral. Any longer and I would have become the mother's, no, earth mother's devout believer. Emlyn blurted out. Father Atravsky raised an eyebrow and said, Feeling somewhat surprised, I didn't compel you to change your faith. The psychological cue I left in you was for you to return to the cathedral every day, hoping that you would be able to fully appreciate the value of life and the joy of a harvest. 
The only effect of the psychological cue was to make me return to the cathedral. Emlyn's expression instantly froze. Father Atravsky nodded frankly. Yes. Emlyn's mouth gaped as he slowly and mechanically turned his head to look back at the altar, looking at the Earth Mother's sacred emblem of life, as if he had become a puppet that very instant. In the evening of the, the 31st of December, 2 Daffodil Street, Tingen City, Benson entered the house, took off his hat and coat, and chuckled. I've booked second-class tickets for the steam locomotive to Backland on the 3rd of January. Melissa, who was sitting in the dining room with several newspapers in front of her, worriedly said, Benson, the air in Backland is terrible. Tens of thousands of people have died from the poison and diseases caused by the smog a few days ago. It's a sad and regretful matter. Benson walked to the dining room, sighed, and said, But the two houses have already passed the report submitted by the National Atmospheric Pollution Council. There will be legislation to regulate the emission of smoke and wastewater, so a new backland will welcome us. You don't have to worry too much. Having said that, he smiled mockingly. When I came back from Iron Cross Street, I found a lot of factory owners or their employees from backland recruiting people. They said that due to the smog and plague, the factories there are suffering a shortage in manpower, so they're willing to promise that the working hours and minimum wage will be much better than the current standard. Ha <laughs> ha. You think it's impossible? Melissa asked. When more and more people flock to Backland, it will be impossible unless both houses pass the corresponding laws directly. Benson spread his hands and pointed to the table. Well, it's time to receive the new year. There were three sets of forks and knives, three empty porcelain plates and three cups on the table. Three cups, one for beer, two for ginger beer. In the evening of the 31st of December, dressed to the nines, Audrey stood inside a lounge, waiting for the start of the New Year's party. However, one couldn't see the excitement, exuberance, and joy on her face despite the fact that she was about to become an adult. In front of her was a newspaper. On it was written, According to preliminary estimates, a total of over 21,000 people died in the fog, and the subsequent plague took the lives of close to 40,000 people. Among the deceased were young children, healthy young men, and women. Few. Audrey couldn't help but close her eyes. Just then, her father, Earl Hall, and her mother, Lady Caitlin, knocked on the door and said in unison, Your beauty surpasses everyone tonight. Darling, it's time. The queen is waiting for you. Audrey slowly breathed out and wore an elegant and beautiful smile. She then walked out of the lounge and entered the party's hall, under the company of her parents. She walked all the way up to the front of the dais and, under the gaze of many, handed her white, muslin-gloved hand to the queen. The queen led her to the edge of the dais as they faced all the guests. After a short pause, the queen smiled and said, Although this is a dark period in Backland's history, we still have a gem that can illuminate the entire city. Her wisdom, her beauty, her character, her etiquette are all impeccable. Today, I will formally introduce her to you, Lady Audrey Hall. Bang, bang, bang. Outside the window, the fireworks exploded into a dreamy light. On the last night of 1349, Audrey officially came of age and was presented to society. In the afternoon of the 3rd of January 1350, on the outskirts of East Borough, in a newly opened cemetery, using divination, Klein found the graves of Old Kohler and Liv. This wasn't a grave in the truest sense of the word, but rather a niche where an urn was stored. They went on, row after row, stacked one above another. Standing there, Klein saw that not only was there no photograph or epitaph on Old Kohler's niche, but even his name was missing. Similar situations weren't uncommon. There were too many ownerless ashes whose relatives and friends couldn't be located. Their names, looks, and whatever experiences they had were unknown, nor did they garner the interest of anyone. They were only distinguished by the numbers on the niches. Klein closed his eyes, pulled out a slip of paper, shook it into a piece of metal, and carved a word on the niche's door, Kohler. Then, he added an epitaph, he was a good worker. He had a wife, a son, and a daughter. He worked hard to live. He withdrew his wrist, and with a shake of his wrist, the black-haired, brown-eyed, and emaciated Klein let the paper burn in his hands, as if it was a memorial service to all the souls residing in the area. Instead of appearing to help Daisy, who had lost her mother and sister, he anonymously wrote to reporter Mike Joseph, describing the girl's predicament in detail so as not to implicate her in his own affairs. Mike had met Daisy, knew about her, and had enthusiastically promoted the establishment of a corresponding charity fund. Therefore, Klein believed that he could help her receive more help so that she could complete her basic studies and find a stable job that could support her. Taking two steps back, Klein looked around, taking in the names, photos, and even the victims who had those missing. 
he raised his head, let out a long breath, turned around, and left the cemetery. On the steam locomotive to Backland, Melissa was engrossed in her textbooks, and Benson was soon chatting with the passengers around him. It's too expensive, just too expensive. A whole ten solely, half a pound. A burly man who wasn't even thirty sighed from the bottom of his heart. If it weren't for the fact that I couldn't buy a third-class seat or a boat ticket recently, I wouldn't have spent this money at all. This is equivalent to half a week's worth of my salary. Indeed, there are too many people heading to Backlund after the new year, Benson agreed. The burly man wiped off his heartbroken expression and said expectantly, because they promised me twenty-one solely a week, and that I wouldn't need to work more than twelve hours a day, we signed a contract. When I receive my first payment and rent a house, my wife will come to Backland, and she'll be able to get a good job. A job that pays about 12 or 13 solely a week. It's said that Backland is in dire need of people. When the time comes, ah, we'll earn a total of over a pound and a half a week, and we'll be able to eat meat frequently. Your wish will definitely be achieved. The king has already signed the bill, passing the law for a minimum wage and maximum working hours. Benson sincerely wished him well before smiling. This is the land of hope. Lou, the steam locomotive brought countless hopeful people to Backland. The sky was still bright, and the fog in the air had thinned a lot. The gas lamps on the platform were no longer lit that early. Experienced, Benson protected his sister and wallet before leaving the station with their suitcases while following the crowd. Suddenly, they simultaneously felt a gaze sweep past them. Tracing the gaze, Benson and Melissa saw a young gentleman with neat black hair and dark brown eyes. The gentleman with the gold-rimmed glasses pressed his hat and looked past them into the distance. Benson and Melissa also looked away and cast their gaze to the smoky pillars in the garden in the middle of the street as they looked forward to seeing the underground transportation system in Backlund. Carrying his suitcase with an expressionless look, Klein walked past them with his body kept straight. He entered the departure station, facing the mass of people pouring into the land of hope. People filled with wonderful hopes in their hearts. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Chapter 483, New Identity The sky was dark outside the window, but it wasn't the dark fog which Klein was used to. The sea waves rolled in, blowing away all the smog and making the clouds line up in various shapes, reflecting the reddish-gold sunlight. This was Pritz Harbor, the largest and busiest port in the Lone Kingdom. Wearing a light vest and white shirt, Klein stood by the window and watched the outside world for a while until his pocket watch urged him to return to the mahogany table. In the warmth of the fireplace, he picked up a black, round fountain pen, unfolded a letter, and slowly wrote, Dear Mr. Azik, forgive me for not writing to you until today, but for the past few days, I've been wandering in Backlund, immersed in the devastation that has been inflicted on this great city by the events of the past few days. If we were ordinary people, perhaps we would have been covered with white cloth and carried to the crematorium, eventually settling in a tiny niche. I've waited for quite a while and finally found an opportunity to retrieve what belongs to me. This includes the card of blasphemy I promised you. In addition, there's another item which I will get the messenger to bring to you as well. It's a copper whistle that can summon a messenger. It comes from a chance encounter of mine, regarding an elder who crawled out of his coffin. I'm sure you're puzzled having read this, as the description I use similarly points to you. This is what puzzles me. This is exactly what happened. I suspect that the original owner of the copper whistle is a member of the numinous episcopate that tries to revive death. Furthermore, his level isn't low. Perhaps you'll be able to tell something from this copper whistle. Before leaving Backland, I will write to the machinery hive mind to describe the massive underground ruin where you fought in C. Zangwill. I hope that they will be able to figure out the truth with the help of this information. After going through a roundabout and indirect test, I've confirmed that they do not have any enmity towards you and me for the time being. If you're in trouble, perhaps you can try seeking their help. Finally, I have one more question. Is there any way to remove the residual mental corruption of a Bayonder characteristic that has already solidified? I am about to set sail. I wish you a smooth journey in finding your memories and a safe journey for myself as well. Your student and friend, Klein Morty. Putting down the pen and reading it once more, Klein folded the letter and stuffed it into the envelope along with the Dark Emperor card and the copper whistle left behind by the suspected Numinous Episcopate member. When he was done, he picked up the copper whistle Mr. Azik had given him and summoned the messenger by blowing into it. The messenger was still nearly four meters tall, made purely of white bones, its eye sockets burning with black fire. However, Klein's spiritual intuition told him that this was another messenger. Sighing secretly, Klein raised his arm and placed the letter into the messenger's lowered palm. The messenger lowered his head to take a look, 
before quickly disintegrating into bones and drilled into the ground like a torrential downpour. Seeing this, Klein lightly tapped his right molar and deactivated his spirit vision. He returned his gaze to the table, where there was a pale yellow identification card. This was a necessary item required for official purchases of any voyage tickets. For this, he had specially gone to Sharon and obtained a new identity through her circle. This identity was that of a bounty hunter, a lunatic who was eager to go on an adventure at sea to get rich. In accordance with Klein's wishes, his name was Jamin Sparrow, a hunter of evil, Klein whispered, putting away a series of documents for his new identity. Shortly after, he drew the curtains, took four steps counterclockwise, and went above the fog. There was still some time before the tarot gathering, so Klein quickly retrieved creeping hunger and wore it on his hand. Closing his eyes, he tried to sense each and every twisted, illusory soul. He attempted to release the faceless. In the real world, Creeping Hunger would happily consume this gift and spit out the corresponding Beyonder characteristic. But above the fog, it didn't dare to act rashly. It allowed the soul of the faceless to leave the glove and appear to the side of the long bronze table. It was a middle-aged man with a blurry face. His twisted and painful feelings seemed to dissipate quite a bit. With difficulty, he bowed at Klein, who was leaning back in his chair. His figure gradually turned dim, almost plummeting beneath the gray fog at any moment. In the majestic palace, Klein could directly communicate without any additional rituals prepared. Thus, he extended his spirituality and stabilized the man before saying in a low voice, Do you know where there are live mermaids? The man answered in an adrift manner, apart from those kept by the Church of the Evernight Goddess. They can only be found by sailing from the Gargas Archipelago towards the Sonya Sea for at least a week. That was my destination. So he's also a faceless seeking to advance. In order to seek out mermaids, he had taken the risk to go out to sea. However, he somehow died at the hands of Rear Admiral Hurricane Kalangos in the end. The Church of the Goddess rears quite a number of mermaids. Klein suddenly asked in realization, Which organization did you belong to? Or should I say, where did your potion formula come from? The blurry-faced middle-aged man's body suddenly trembled. It was only two seconds later that he spoke up. The Secret Order. I belong to the Secret Order. Secret Order. Doesn't the Secret Order rear their own mermaids? Klein hesitated for a moment before asking, Have you ever seen your leader, Zeratol? The illusory and transparent faceless was silent at first, but then he shouted with a sharp voice, I have. H. He's abnormal. He's an undying monster. As he spoke, his figure became increasingly thin, almost on the verge of dissipating. As expected, Zeratol is still alive. Just what had happened for a Secret Order member to be so afraid of him. More accurately, I should use him. Klein quickly asked about another key issue. Apart from the treasures left behind by the Antigonus family and what your secret order has, is there anywhere I can get the high-sequence Beyonder formulas for the Seer pathway? The faceless turned increasingly transparent and more illusory. He finally left the words, The Church of the Evernight Goddess, Cathedral of Serenity, the Holy Cathedral. Klein silently watched as the faceless's spirit body achieved complete liberation as he repeated the words. The Cathedral of Serenity was the headquarters of the Church of the Evernight Goddess, also known as the Holy Cathedral according to the Nighthawks. There really are high-sequence potion formulas of the seer pathway hidden there. I wonder how many secrets the various churches have kept buried and hidden. Sighing, Klein let the dark green glue-like substance that had formed on the surface of his glove slide onto the surface of the long bronze table. The faceless Beyonder characteristic eventually formed a jelly-like translucent object. In the dark green background, from time to time, there were different faces emerging, like shadows hidden behind dark curtains. Klein took a few looks before nodding indiscernibly. He muttered to himself, I'll use the world later to get Mr. Hanged Man to sell this Beyonder characteristic either to artisans or Beyonders who need it. Although he had found a flaw in the official Beyonders surveillance of 15 Minsk Street by means of divination above the gray fog, he didn't return there so as to not provoke them or expose the secrets of his spirit body. Instead, he spent extra money to buy a change of clothing and other daily necessities. All of that amounted to 12 pounds. Together with the 8 pounds paid for the documents of his new identity, his wallet was so empty that there was almost no need for it to exist. As for the 10% stake in the bike company, Klein found an opportunity to meet with Isengard Stanton and signed a legal agreement to entrust the matter to him. After all, their relationship wasn't a secret in the eyes of the Nighthawks or the machinery hive mind. I still have five pounds in cash and five gold coins. It will cost four pounds to head for the Rorsted Archipelago, and that's for a third-class ticket at the lower deck. It would take at least four pounds to go from the Rorsted Archipelago to the Gargas Archipelago. 
I have to quickly sell off the faceless Beyonder characteristic. This way, I would be able to afford a second-class cabin and eat decent food. Thanks to Imlin's suitcase being placed above the gray fog all this time, I've had to buy another one. Klein silently went through his financial situation, feeling as if he had returned to the time when he had just transmigrated, relying on the salary of the Nighthawks before he could even buy a suit. A sequence 6 Beyonder characteristic varies between 3,000 to 4,000 pounds. If I encounter someone in desperate need for it, then it can be sold at a premium. But apart from maintaining my living expenses, I have to consider the cost of the Nimble Rite Master's supplementary ingredients. I also have to consider the cost of the ritual needed to eliminate the mental corruption. Klein sighed and took out his pocket watch to take a look at it. Seeing that it was about time, he sent a message to Little Sun to prepare for the gathering. Forza's vision turned clear as she saw three figures sitting across the long, mottled table. A new member. With a thought, she quickly settled down. At this moment, she didn't care if the tarot club had any new members. Her mind was filled with the incident of the smog and plague from last week. She vividly remembered that the world had warned herself and Miss Justice at the last gathering that something huge was brewing in Backland, which could likely bring about a tragedy. Mr. Fool had confirmed that conjecture, and he had further pointed out that the person at the heart of the problem was Prince Edisac. She didn't doubt Mr. Fool's abilities and felt that the tragedy needed time to brew, giving her plenty of time to investigate. Who knew that it would come so quickly and so suddenly? Prince Edisac was also reported to have been infected in the haze and unfortunately died. It really happened. It really happened. Thinking back to the contents of the newspapers from a few days ago, she seemed to understand something, but she wasn't sure of it. For a moment, she felt terrified and uneasy. As a sequence 9, I seemed to have become involved with terrifying matters that involved a huge city, a prince, and tens of thousands of lives just because I'm a member of the tarot club. It was only at this moment that the magician, Fors, realized the importance of being a member of the tarot club. Then, she heard Miss Justice's usual greeting that lacked her exuberance. Good afternoon, Mr. Fool. You saved Backland again. Uh, what? When was I saved again? The moon and Lin listened blankly. Chapter 484, Asymmetrical. As he thought back to the recent events, the moon, and Lin, was quick to associate it with the great smog and the plague outbreak, guessing that this was what the lady opposite him was referring to. But I heard that it was the work of a demoness of despair who was trying to advance herself. Furthermore, the Church of the Lord of Storms responded quickly, creating a hurricane to blow everything away. How could it be said that the fool saved Backlund? Imlin, who had an entire clan behind him, was quite well informed. Upon doing the comparison, it was hard for him not to be surprised and confused. Although he had always been proud and didn't wish to spend time on social interactions, he still felt an instinctive fear when faced with a hidden existence that he had to address with he. He didn't dare to open his mouth to ask and decided to listen for a while. Alger, even though he was drifting out at sea, had received news of the great smog in Backland. He was interested in the secrets and the truth behind it, confident in the belief that this was definitely a struggle between deities. After all, it had attracted the attention of Mr. Fool. I'll ask Miss Justice when we exchange information. However, she might not be too sure of the details. It's rather impossible for her to know too many details based on her standing. Aha, uh -huh. she has great curiosity. To open up with such a greeting, she would definitely attempt to get an answer from Mr. Fool, hoping to get an answer. I hope that I have the opportunity to listen in from the side. With this in mind, Alger turned his head to look at the sun. Seeing how he wasn't anxious but calm and reserved, he knew that the City of Silver's exploratory team had already broken out from the fate of repeating their lives. Similarly, Audrey, who had figured out that the operation was successful from reading Little Sun's reaction, heaved a secret sigh of relief. She prepared herself to understand what had happened later in detail. After a solemn bow towards Mr. Fool, she thanked the seemingly unkind tarot club member, the World, for his advance warning. <laughs> Mr. World, if it wasn't for your advance warning, then perhaps tens of thousands of people would have died in Backland during this great smog. In truth, I was also doing it to save myself. Klein controlled the world to give a hoarse laugh. He said it with sincerity and without any trace of acting because if it wasn't for Miss Justice who was notified in advance and warned the Church of the Evernight Goddess, then the powerful existence who erased Mr. A wouldn't have arrived in time, and he himself might not have been able to hold on for long. If Mr. A had disintegrated me and ate me, then perhaps I might not have a chance of reviving. Klein thought in appreciation. Mr. A's feasting would literally be feasting. Immediately after, as the fool, he leaned back in his chair and responded with a smile. 
All I did was provide some trivial help. No, your Adora really helped save Backlund. His contribution is the greatest amongst everyone. Audrey prays from the bottom of her heart. His warning allowed the goddess, the church of the Evernight goddess to make preparations, wiping out the demoness of despair in a timely manner and preventing the primordial demoness from awakening. It allowed the contamination of the great smog to be kept under control. Furthermore, he even destroyed the Aurora Order's ritual, preventing the attempted descent of the true creators once again, keeping him at bay from the real world. Audrey received unanimous praise by Earl Hall and his wife for providing the most important information. They hadn't concealed the results of the investigation and some of the details they had gathered from her. Of course, they also raised their wish as parents that their daughter wasn't to get too involved with that secret organization. It would be enough if she stayed in the outer circle and gathered some information, then maintained her strength below that of Sequence 7. The Primordial Demoness's Awakening The True Creator's Attempted Descent What exactly happened in Backland? At the same time, Alger and Imlin had the same reaction, but their expressions were different. The former only slightly raised his eyelids as his pupils contracted, unconsciously sitting to the side a bit, while the latter gave the illusion that he was about to jump up. Mother, no, esteemed Moon, when did Backland become so dangerous? Two evil gods had actually made their appearance during the Great Smog. Is that young lady lying? Even though Mr. Fool is in existence suspected of being a deity, it's also impossible that he would simultaneously offend two entities of the same level, right? Could it be that he is actually the incarnation of a true god? Or is there an alliance of deities behind him? Is that why the ancestor asked me to pray to him? The more Imlin thought about it, the faster his heart beat, but it was impossible for him to receive verification. The fact that Sanguine had the nickname Vampire didn't mean that they didn't have a heartbeat. It was just that they were relatively slow, and the heart itself was one of the Sanguine's fatal weaknesses. Indeed, indeed it's an event that had attracted the attention of Mr. Fool. But, what benefits could he gain from sabotaging the evil god's plans? Alger sighed inwardly. Frizz was surprised and frightened. She didn't expect that the horrible great smog that had taken the lives of tens of thousands of people would conceal an even more horrifying truth. If it hadn't been stopped in time, the whole of Backland would have been destroyed, and Zeo and I wouldn't have survived. Frizz swallowed a mouthful of saliva hard. Her feelings were similar to Audrey's feelings as well. Through this matter, this young noble lady clearly understood one thing which was that the life she believed to be peaceful and calm was like a soap bubble amidst a clash between deities. Just a slight perturbation could immediately pop it into nothingness. Or it could be said that the entire kingdom, the entire human society, exists only because of the balance between the deities, and this balance is extremely fragile. Every time a similar thought gushed to her mind, Audrey felt a wave of grief wash over her. Klein was pleased when he saw that someone knew and remembered his contribution. He smiled and said, unfortunately, he has to stay away from Backland as a result. Mr. Fool's adorer has to temporarily leave Backland. Audrey stood up again and sincerely bowed. Please convey my gratitude to him. Klein maintained his image without giving a reply other than nodding his head. At this moment, Audrey added, I'm very sorry, as the three churches and the military are cleaning up Backland, I was unable to get the follow-up pages to Roselle's diary. Please wait one more week. Sure, Klein said in a flat tone. Hearing their conversation, Frizz was startled as she hurriedly looked to the end of the long bronze table and said, Dear Mr. Fool, I received three pages of Roselle's diary. Not bad. War members mean more channels, and many things snowball quickly. Klein gently nodded. Very good. Roselle's diary. Emlyn felt as if he had heard something extraordinary again. Under his puzzled gaze, Frizz conjured three pages of the diary and passed them on to Mr. Fool. Only then did Klein remember that he had missed introducing a particular vampire. Smiling, he introduced, This is a new member, Mr. Moon. This gathering is called the Tarot Club. They are. Mr. Moon, I thought it would be a lady who would choose the moon. Audrey greeted politely while her thoughts scattered. Similarly, Emlyn wondered whether the members such as the Hanged Man and Justice were humans or transcendent creatures, which pathways they were from, at which sequences, from which organizations, or if they were friendly to the Sanguine. Klein didn't care about them sizing each other up as he cast his gaze to the diary entries in his hands. The 11th of February. Today, I found out about a secret of the Sauron family. Ha ha ha. I'm going to die from laughter. Ha ha ha. So it turns out that the hunter pathway that they possess will change gender at sequence 4. Men wouldn't change, but women will change into men. It's no wonder that none of the high sequence beyonders of the Sauron family that I'm aware of are female. The iron-blooded knight is indeed a true man. Ha ha ha, if it wasn't for how sensitive this secret was, then I would even feel like ridiculing Florin next time. 
the Sauron family ancestor that he looks like might have been a woman. This potion is way too much of a trap, isn't it? I hope the savant pathway wouldn't have any strange changes upon reaching the high sequences. I don't want to one day suddenly realize that I either don't advance or I have to change into a woman. The first thought that flashed through Klein's mind at the sight of this diary entry was, Emperor, you won't become a woman, but you will do it with a demoness, perhaps more than one. Indeed, there's a pathway that changes women to men. Furthermore, it's within the ones I expected. Hunter represents war, causing women to change genders at sequence 4. This is a little odd. The demoness pathway changes at sequence 7 which, it doesn't actually strictly correspond. Klein felt the warped and feeling of madness even more acutely. It was a result of the extreme asymmetry. Could it be that the underlying logic of this world is chaos, distortion, madness, and asymmetry? He tried his hardest not to frown. The 12th of February. This won't do. I want to laugh whenever I see Florin. Ha 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 ha. The 15th of February. The modified artillery I designed and supervised was completed. The effect was worse than I expected, but the problem isn't that great. With it in mass production, I'll be able to show the world what true advanced tactics are. In order to celebrate, I decided to hold a banquet to invite those fellows who look down on me. Just wait to be slapped in the face. The emperor truly doesn't let a grudge go. While sighing, Klein turned to the second page of the diary. The 5th of May, that unspeakable organization called for another gathering. I'm struck by the way they gather their members every time. It's phenomenal, no, a miracle. With my earlier observations, I raised some problems at this gathering. For example, all the sequence zero names have a high enough level on the blasphemy slate. Only Red Priest appears rather unique. It doesn't sound strong enough. The old gentleman sitting beside me told me that Red represents the Red of War and priest can be understood as the ritualist of strength at its core. Someone objected, believing that the priest in Red Priest represents being a priest of that creator. I leaned towards the former and asked for the name of the old gentleman in a low voice. I didn't know the identity of every member. To put it in an extreme manner, I only know a portion of them. The old gentleman answered me with a smile. He said his name was Hermes. Hermes, the Hermes who created the language of ancient Hermes. Hermes, the founder of humanity's mysticism. 